On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. Um, it is so good to be in the house at third Thursday. A um, couple of things before we be really begin to dig in. Uh, unashamedly going on my 10-year man crush on Jeremy Rose. You guys, that's easy to do, isn't it? Um, I, I love this man, and I love this church. We... Um, you know, you know as, as a pastor, you don't get to have many Sundays off, but several years ago, we brought our staff team up here to retreat overnight here and brought them to worship here because I knew it was going to be a life-giving, solid, gospel-oriented experience. And I just love your perseverance in this place. Did I hear you guys talking about a 15-year celebration? Was that for the church? Is that coming up? Like this month? Next month? Next month. Come on! 15 years. I love it. Woo! Um, Glory to God, because um, what a testimony of his faithfulness in you. But man, I mean, in a, what's up, Hazlet? What is up? <laughs> That's what happens when you come in late, you know. <laughs> um, I, uh, I haven't been here. This is a perfect segue. I haven't been here in about two years um, because of that man, that man right there. No, we, um, Derek is an elder here at Axis, if you don't know Derek, but he also works for a group called Generis in our church in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, real life, real life church. That's that's what happens when you put life in the name of your church. Like it's like new life, life point, you know, center life, Jesus is life. Uh, real life church. Derek has served us so well because he helped us um, navigate how do we lead this really young, growing church through a fundraising campaign, a vision campaign uh, to build a building. And by God's grace, we are, uh, we'll, Lord willing, we'll move into a building in Clarksville, Tennessee, just down the road up the road um, in December. Um, but that's where I've been. I, like, I, have, like, I, I turned down every invitation to speak at my kids' Christian school for the past two years. So I just have had my head down. I'm a very limited man, uh, and um, I'm very aware of my limitations. And so it may sound silly to you, you know, but seriously, I've just been like full throttle uh, focus with my head down. Um, I do want to show one thing to you. You won't be impressed by this, but hopefully it'll inspire you to maybe do something similar. One of our values at our church is equip and empower. I'm kind of obsessed by that value. You know, it's, it's as a pastor, it's our job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, right? So um, for us, it's the most important thing is not that we get the job done, but it's how we get the job done, right? And we want to get the job done by equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So one of the things I did, I guess it was last summer, um, but I asked uh, a handful, about 10, 12 guys in our church to preach nine-minute sermons. And uh, just, uh, you know, all about experimenting. I loved it because we were leaning into our value um, of equipping and power. I'm just going to push these guys out. They'll appreciate your preaching a lot more if you give them an opportunity to do it. You know, they'll be like, that was harder than I thought. And if you give them nine minutes, it'll be a lot harder than, than, than they think. Um, the congregation loved it. You know, we live in this generation where like uh, you're, uh, somebody help me, um, you're, uh, thank you, who said that, my brother, thank you, uh, your attention span, you know, so having three different guys preach on three different attributes of God, like nine minutes, nine minutes, nine minutes, they were like totally engaged. Um, it came together so well that we asked them to put it in written form and, um, uh, so a little self-published book on Amazon, right? See, none of you are impressed by that. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to honor these men because most of them never dreamed that they would have anything ever published. And so we, we captured their picture and we put their message in this book and then we make the book available to the congregation. So I just encourage you to do that because man, it fires your guys up. Your congregation loves it. And it's really easy to do. Literally all you do is you get a gra you, you you give uh, your content in a PDF and get a graphic designer to make it look beautiful. Upload it. There you go. So I just brought everybody a copy of that. Um, but hopefully the idea inspires you. I, I really only have two good ministry ideas. That was one of them. All right. Um, and the second one's called the Sunday after Easter party. It's gold. But it's all I got. So if you want to hear about the Sunday after Easter party, I'll tell you about it later. Um, but here's, here's what it does. We had um, 
Like three years in a row, we had more people the Sunday after Easter than we had on Easter. Like nobody's ever done that that I've talked to, right? But that's all we got, all right? So I can tell you all about it. Okay, um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey. My talk titled um, is uh, uh, Making Disciples and Leading the Church, Friends or Foes. And um, I, I hope that this will be a little interactive. I've got some interactive stuff, you know, engaged for us. But I'm super fired up to share this with you guys. Let me, let me tell you a little bit of, about my experience and see if this resonates with you guys. God called me to preach, um, and almost like, almost like immediately in this call to preach, there was both this understanding of I'm going to serve the church, lead in the church, and I'm going to make disciples. It was just kind of, kind of this awareness that was there. And I experienced uh, disciple making like through uh, both through the programmatic approach in the church that I was growing up in and in a personal discipling uh, approach from my student pastor, but didn't really know what was going on, you know. And uh, so um, let me check my notes, just make sure I'm on track here. Here's, here's what... Here's what, um, here's what I'm hoping to do today is eliminate a little bit of the frustration that you may experience. Here, this was my experience. Okay, I'm called to serve the church. Jesus is really clear about his mission of making disciples. You get into a church work, and all the duties of serving a church have the potential and sometimes easily then hijack your time and your energy and your focus in this kind of personal disciple-making mission. And uh, some of us may even th this morning, this what, noonday, lack confusion uh, or rather have confusion. We may actually even lack clarity on how do these two realities come together? Do they come together easily? How, you know, how, how, does it, how does it happen? So, so this was my experience. Um, I, start, I start working, I start serving in the church and I begin to experience that reality of, okay, I'm on fire to make disciples, but the duties of the church like seem to be like overwhelming. Let me let's just do a quick brainstorm. You guys help me with this. Um, what in church ministry doesn't feel like disciple making to you? So whatever you say is the honest answer. Is the right answer. What in church ministry does not feel like? So let me unpack. Let me unpack the, like the disciple making piece a little bit. Um, as I begin to read through the scripture, you begin to get a picture of Jesus' approach to, to disciple making. What was that? You see that Jesus ministered to the masses. He invested in 12. He went really deep with three. And somebody recently said, and consider his beloved John, right? Like really double down on one. So consider that. Jesus' approach to disciple making, ministered to the masses, invested in 12, went deep with three, Really, really invested in John. As you watch how Jesus did it, what you see is there was uh, invitational, intentional, and relational, right? So, so, so then some of us, somewhere along the way, let me know if you ever read the book Master Plan of Evangelism, Robert Coleman, right? So you read that book as you're reading the Gospels, and you're like, okay, I've got a vision for disciple making. And then you get into the church, and you're like, whoa. Well, how do these two things go together, leading the church and, and making disciples? So what in your experience in the local church does not feel like that disciple-making description? What do you got? Managing the budget. Managing budget. Good. Uh, email. email. <laughs> Satanic email. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Graphic design. For sermon series, what else? So many meetings. Meetings and meetings. And I would add to that business meetings. In my church in Arizona that I pastored, we had a business meeting once a month. And the same old eight ornery dudes would come to the meeting every month and ask the same questions and be like, well, you know, you asked that question last month and the answer hasn't changed. What else does not feel like disciple making to you? Facility management. Right. What else? Scheduling. What else? Uh, 
I mean, sometimes small groups don't. Sometimes assimilation doesn't. What do you, what else you guys got? Social media strategy. Right? So just as we write these up on the board, you begin to feel this tension of like, here's the duties, here's the reality, here's the church, here's what's required, right? I mean, in, in, within the church, you got caring for the widows, and we, we could make a great case for that being under the umbrella of disciple making. But as we think about the way Jesus went about disciple making, investing in the 12, doubling down in three, going really deep with this one, um, there's often this gulf in our experience of all that we're responsible for and what we're burning to see take place. Are you, does anybody feel this? Does anybody experience this reality at all? I may be, I may be the only one. But essentially what happens, what, what, what happened for me for then 15 years is trying to figure out, okay, how do these two come together? Like, how do these two, two come together? And then you'd go, I'd go to a church conference. <laughs> and, you know, so, so um, I was going to start my talk, and I forgot to do this, uh, by, by letting you guys fill in the blank on this. The local church is all about fill in the blank. In, 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 or the local ch church ought to be all about fill in the blank. And, and probably 80% of us would say making disciples. Making disciples. And then we go to the church conference, and we feel terrible about how effectively our church is making disciples, right? And we come back inflamed with passion on making disciples, right? Let's, let's come back and let's just kick everything to the curb that does not fall within those narrow parameters of Minister of the masses, 12, 3, one with, one with the beloved. You guys feeling what I'm, the, the tension I'm, I'm trying to create here a little bit? Um, so this is what, um, I, I, I got to talk to an old friend, uh, Dustin Neely, and hear his uh, heart for starting this care uh, ministry to pastors. I love uh, Pastors Who Last, PAC here, that Jeremy leads and his team leads of caring for pastors. I share this same heart and I see pastors um, existing in this state of frustration all the time of not knowing how to bring these two realities together of leading the church and making disciples. And then when you see pastors going to conferences, they come back on fire, but quickly find themselves immensely frustrated because here's what happens. In my experience, what I've seen is that pastors will come, and uh, this will be disciple making. And this will be leading the church. We'll come back from a conference. They'll read a great discipleship book. We'll, we'll feel like we're terrible at it. We'll be like, okay, we're going all in now. We're going we're gonna to reform the church. We're going to get everything right. And what, here's what we want to do. We want to take this circle of leading the church and lay it on top of this circle, disciple making, so that everything that we do in the church, you take that one, you take this one, and you lay it right on top of each other. And every pastor that's ever tried to do this has been driven insane because you, because you can't do it in, in, and I, would, and I would submit, I don't think we ought to try to do it. So well, you're like, okay, why, why? Why, why is that? Okay, all right, we, we're taking the bait. So what do you, you know, what do you, what do you got here? All right. Um, I, I haven't taken a deep dive. I haven't read what like everybody says about this. I've just done kind of more, more of my own personal reflection on this. Um, so I'm not bringing you like a PhD well-researched talk today, okay? Um, but here's, I, I do know that there's a lot of conversation out there that goes like um, the church has a mission and Jesus' mission has a church. Well, which one is it? Well, I think it's both. Let me, let me explain. So, um, so when Jesus said, make disciples, give me the text. 
Matthew 28. Somebody quote it really loud like you're a man. Mm. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I command you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the world. Hallelujah. Do you remember when that gripped your heart? Do you remember when you said, I'll go anywhere and do anything at any time, at any cost for Jesus to make disciples? You remember when that gripped your heart in that way? All right. Make, make disciples. Lost my train of thought. Give me just a second. I got too excited about this. Somebody help me. Where was I? Thank you. Say it again. Yeah, thank you. Here's the mission. Make disciples. Here's the, idea that I, here's the idea that may take a little reflection for you this morning. Um, the holy sacred scriptures came to us progressively, okay? So when Jesus gave the great commission, um, and then when the gospel authors wrote it down, we didn't have the epistles yet, right? When the Old Testament came to the Hebrew people, uh, Jesus had not yet stepped on the scene in the flesh yet, right? So, so the scriptures came to us progressively, right? Most of us here today would agree the canon is complete, right? The scripture is complete. We have our, this, a copy of the sacred scriptures. There's no books going to be added to the sacred scripture. But it came to us progressively. And I think one, I think one of the dangers is, is we, we double down on make disciples. And, and it, it becomes this, this burden to turn everything that we do in the local church into disciple making. And, and I don't think that that's what we should do. Because what was the goal of making disciples? The church. So, if you don't understand, like, what the, what's the goal of this mission? Um, then you, then you'll, you'll miss the goal, right? So the goal was the church. Now, here's the beautiful part, right? Is the church, it's not all that the church should do, but the church has a mission. And what's the church's mission? Make disciples. If, they, if they're effective at making disciples, what's going to happen? They're going to multiply churches, right? And what, and what are churches to do? They're to make disciples. So... On the, on the drive up, uh, our executive pastor, Ben Reed, said, uh, what, what's your talk today? And I gave him a much better version than I'm giving you right now. You know how that goes, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and then he very succinctly said, so the church is both the means and the end. I was like, yes, yes, that's it. So, so here's what you've got. Now, here's the thing is the church, she has a mission that's to make disciples, but it's not all she does, right? Oh, You've got, you've got like dozens of one another commands. Pray for one another, encourage one another, rebuke one another, bear with one another, love one another, outdo one, one another in showing honor, right? So, so the church isn't just to live the mission. The church is to be a family living out these one another's, right? The church is to care for orphans and widows, and that doesn't always feel experientially like investing in the 12, doubling down in the three. Do you, are, you, are, you, are you tracking what I'm saying? So... So the church's mission is to make disciples. I don't think we're debating that today, but it's not all that the church does. Here's a beautiful text that I think helps us. Here's what I'm hoping, here's what I'm hoping this will do. I'm hoping that this will, on some level, help alleviate the frustration that you may feel in ministry as a pastor of trying to overlap, make disciples in all the duties in leading the church, trying to overlap those so that, they, so that it's all one. I want, I want you to experience some freedom to say they're not exactly the same. There's really rich, wonderful, rewarding, life-giving overlap between the two. But, but to try to lay it over on top of it, every pastor that I've seen attempt to do that ends up in frustration. Um, it, it, it doesn't, it's not good for his soul. Like he just, it doesn't lead to joy. It just leads to frustration. And so I think, that there's a, I think there's a better way where these two things that feel like foes sometimes, right? All the duties of the church 
feel like they're robbing you from focused disciple making sometimes. So it feels like a foe. I think that they can be, I think that they can be friends. So we've already quoted the Matthew 28 text, but let me just read Ephesians 3, 7 through 13 for us. Um, Paul writes, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, amen, Paul, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Okay, are you, are you, are you hearing kind of this build up here? There was a mystery hidden. Paul's call comes. Inside of Paul's call, this, this, this mystery is now being revealed. Well, what is the mystery? Verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you, do not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Do you, are, do you see in this? That's the goal. The goal is the church. And this was the eternal goal. In Christ, it was God's plan. Not just that we would only obsess over making disciples and feel terrible when our church is really poor at making disciples, right? But rather the goal of being the church, look at it with me again in the text. This is just so rich. Verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be now, now it's made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I mean, that is deep, wild stuff right there, right? The demonic realm, the angelic realm, they're all watching with suspense. How's this going to turn out? What is God up to? And then the church is birthed. And what the church does is show the wisdom of the infinitely valuable and eternal God. That's what the church does. So we've got to be careful beating ourselves up when our church is struggling at disciple making. We've got to stop beating ourselves up when we as pastors can't get more of our church to, to align with, with disciple making. And, and we've got to marvel again at what the bride of Christ is. We've got to marvel again at what the church is. We, 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 we've got to be struck with awe and wonder that this flock that we get to shepherd and guide and build into and visit this person and respond to that email and like all of that. Like if you, if you, if you hate that and you want to get back to that, then you don't understand what that's all about, right? So it's not a, it's not an either or, it's a both and. It's a both and. So visually, this has kind of gotten kind of satisfactory to me. Rather than trying to lay those two circles on top of each other, I just like to call this, this the making disciples. This circle is making disciples. And this is leading the church. And this, this, man, this is that sweet spot right here. And this is so rewarding. And this is so exciting. And this is, this is that area when all of our duties of the church overlap beautifully with that investing in the 12 going deep in the three. So here's, so here's what I have personally is both a conviction and a goal. I have a conviction and a goal that I will always be or always be moving toward investing in 12-ish and investing deeply in three-ish. Just, it's just a conviction. As I, as I read the gospels, as I see how did Jesus make disciples, I'm thinking I can't improve on his approach. That's what I want to do. I want to always be doing that in the life of the church. So I strategically think about how can I engage in the mission that he's given the church in a way that actually serves leading the church, right? 
and you guys are already doing this, but I just want to encourage you in it because um, this is beautiful. So, so for our, we, we've got a kid pastor coming to join our staff team in October, right? So he's got, he's got his kid ministry team. Well, why not disciple your small group leaders? And then it's that, it's that beautiful sweet spot where you're really investing, you're seeking to reproduce yourself in this group of people, uh, and, and, and then it, it, it overlaps really beautifully there. Okay, so I want you to hold that. I want you to capture a couple of questions like with that. This is, this is like, this is kind of, this is just fresh stuff for me, and I want your input on it. Um, even, even this for me is like probably like two years old. Like it's just like the grind of 15 years of trying to figure out how does the mission of Jesus make disciples come together with the duties of leading the church? Because it's often frustrating. You often feel like you're doing one really, really well, one really, really, really poorly. Let's do that around the tables real quick. Um, if you need to jump in on a table, do that. I'm just going to give you like two minutes. Um, as you evaluate right now, like where you are, leading the church skillfully or faithfully making disciples, um, where are you? Where, where, where do you need to adjust a little bit uh, as you evaluate where you are? Do you want to see more intentionality? a more relational approach, a better commitment, more effective personal disciple making? Or do you, need to, do you need to give more attention to leading the church with skill, thinking about systems and thinking about organizing and thinking about caring for widows and thinking, go ahead and discuss around your tables and give you two minutes. Ready, set, go. I think they'll join you guys right here. Here's uh, case study A, that discussion is always better than the talk. Okay, case study A, we had a fist bump going across the table right here during the discussion, <laughs> saw no fist bumps during the talk, right? right? Like there was around the discussion, arm went across the table, reciprocated, good stuff happens when we discuss, right? Thank you for brotherhood. No, no, it's all right, it's all right, too late now, too late now. Um, okay, so we, uh, we lead our church in a military community, and what a massive privilege it is leading in a military community, just surrounded by soldiers. These guys are heroes, these men and women. It's amazing. Um, uh, navigators is a big deal kind of in these, in these military communities. And so if you know navigators, man, they are like ninjas at making disciples, right? I mean, just ninjas at making disciples. And, um, and so we've got some, some guys that have been discipled in and through navigators. And so um, they have a concept of becoming a disciple making disciple. Um, but as I've kind of been coming into a little bit of clarity for my own self and how we're leading our church, um, I've been inviting him to consider, hey, um, there's actually some other growth steps for you to consider beyond just being a disciple making disciple. And it's being a leader. It's being a leader. Being being aspiring to the office of elder, aspiring to the office of pastor. What do I mean by that? Well, again, think with me about the progressive nature of God's revelation coming to us. Okay, think with me about that, right? So Jesus, he makes disciples, he commissions them to go and make disciples, but he's not done. He's not done. He's going to send his spirit. He's going to give birth to his church, right? He's going to put the calling of a leader on people's lives to step forward in leadership. So he's not, he's not done. So being a disciple-making disciple is not the lid here, right? Um, and, and so you see this in the epistles, right, where he says, look among you and, and find those, those dudes that are going to be your, your leaders. Um, so, uh, so for a guy that's been discipled in the Navigators, it's a little bit of a stretch for him to think that there's anything above and better than being a disciple-making disciple. Disciple, but he's stretching with me a little bit. And I want to, um, I, this is, you guys are going to help me today with things we're chewing on for our church. But I've given you a resource there at your table. That's what we're calling right now, just our discipleship and leadership map. And, and what I'm wanting to do with this resource in our church is just to give our church a resource that allows anybody in our church to self-assess where they are in the journey in the growth journey with the Lord. Now, before you think I'm a dispensationalist, and that's not intended to be an insult for those of you that are, um, I, I, I personally, my personal conviction is if you're saved, you're a disciple, okay? So I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, there, there's a difference there. Um, but uh, what, 
here's, here's what we're doing with these columns is what's true about someone that's saved? What's true about them? Um, and what must happen for someone to be saved? And then what's true about a disciple? And then what's true about a disciple maker? Uh, and then what's true about a leader? So what are the marks of someone that's saved? What are the marks of someone that's a disciple? What are the marks of someone that's a disciple maker? Um, what's, a, what's the marks of someone that's a leader? And then what's the marks of someone that's a leader of leaders? Um, uh, this, it's just a tool. It's just a resource. It's not a law to lay upon your people. It's not a burden to say, climb the ladder, right? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a compass. It's a, it's a resource for them to take an honest assessment of where they are. Let me tell you how this kind of works out um, in, you know, for us. As a church plant, when you're planting a church like we did six years ago, you move forward with a coalition of the willing. Can I get an amen? You're like, you have a pulse and you've got all your teeth. You will work, right? Like, yes, well, you, you need to be at the door, right? Um, so we've got people that lead ministry teams that don't walk intimately with the Lord, sadly. It's just the reality. They, they don't delight daily in God, but they somehow found their way into leading our loadout team. It, it just kind of happened in a church plant. And things are moving fast, and you got to have people overseeing responsibility, and you put responsibility in their hand. And so what this is intended to do is to allow every leader of every ministry team in our church assess how am I doing as a disciple? I'm a leader. <laughs> I have responsibility. I'm, I'm accountable to this responsibility. They're asking me to influence other people. But, man, I'm not, even, I'm not even walking as a disciple right now, right? And so it kind of shows them a, like a pattern of development on where we want them. So for us moving forward as we mature as a church... What we hope is that this will actually be a progression where people will know, okay, if I'm going to be a leader, well, I need to walk with God. And before I, before I begin to lead people, I need to disciple people, right? So it's a little bit of a progression. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just, just two or three minutes around, around your table. I want you to fill this in, maybe collectively, just brainstorm kind of as, as many little marks as you can. Um, and, and let me tell you again, what's true about someone that's saved and what, um, what must happen? For someone to be saved. What's true about someone that is a disciple? What's a mark of a disciple? What's a mark of a disciple maker? What's a mark of a leader? What's a mark of a leader of leaders? Can you do that around your table? Just take a couple minutes collectively. Go for it. Rapid fire, bullet point style. Grab your pens, fill them out. All right, all right. Um, hey, I know you haven't had enough time like, like to do it. We're not taking up assignments. You're not writing your names on them, right? Like I'm just, just stirring the pot a little bit. Um, let me, let me pull you back, and we'll land the plane this morning. Um, so let me, uh, I just got some good feedback. Let me provide one little layer of clarity. This is what I was really hoping for. Um, uh, so, uh, so to be clear, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm submitting to you is that we actually do both of these circles, not just the, what's the overlap here. In, in, in other words... What I'm, what I'm trying to encourage you in is, is this reality. You're going to do things to lead the church and, and display the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities, right, um, that don't feel like disciple-making, not as, not as we saw Jesus making disciples. They don't feel like it, but it's being the church and leading the church, and that is glorious. So I don't want that to be lost on you. I want you to have a robust vision of the beauty of the bride of Christ and to know and feel the honor in, in leading her, even though it may not feel like the mission, okay? As we kind of all first tasted the mission of, you know, every one of us could go around the room and say, so-and-so discipled me. They invested in me. I didn't know that that's what they were doing, but they made a deposit in me, right? Um, and then sometimes we're going to engage in disciple making that doesn't translate into leading the church. In our context, we just brought a guy up on stage uh, this past Sunday. It was his last Sunday, uh, and uh, he's PCSing to a new military base, right? Um, so our college and young adult minister invested in him for a year, and it did not translate into building our church. It translated into, you know, advancing the kingdom and, and building the global 
see church. Um, but sometimes making disciples is not going to translate into, into that, it, what you're responsible for day in, day out. Okay, so both of those. Let me, let me ask real quick, real quick, what questions of clarity or what questions of curiosity has the resource or the talk uh, given you so far? Are we building people for our church or are we building people for the kingdom? Yeah. And if they go, they go. Yeah. Like, what, where's that mark? I don't so, know, yeah. That's a, Great question. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm oh, sorry. no, it makes, makes perfect sense. So here's what I would say. Um, grace-infused clarity is the goal. And I, what I would say is, is we're already making these judgments and assessments organically, whether, we've, whether or not we've written them down or not. We make them every single day we interact with church people, right? The people that you're choosing to lead ministry, you're either making, like, you're either drawing upon your instinct, with it, with, with, which is shaped from your experience in God's wisdom that you haven't written down, or you've actually written down what you're looking for in a leader, Right, and so so if you take someone under your care, uh, this phrase that embodies kind of what you're talking about, but I love that father son in the faith language. My hope is this will be a springboard for you, and you'll be like, oh man, I can put a resource together using our language and you know our things in our church. But if you look down in the middle, the help that a disciple maker provides, it's intimate, right? That that it embodies that father son thing that you're describing there. But I would just say in the scripture, we do see this reality of uh, like church discipline, right? Where Paul said, hey, the immoral man in your midst, remove him from the fellowship. And then by God's grace, that design was effective. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul saying, receive him back into the fellowship, right? So there was, an, there was a judgment on his behavior. And it was an objective observation on his behavior, which was sexu gross sexual immorality, that resulted in removing him from the fellowship, okay? So, so, I, so I, there's a description, whether or not you look at that as a prescription or not, there's a description of what Paul was telling the church at Corinth to do. Um, so I would just say we're doing it organically on some level, um, but what I started with like grace-infused clarity, right? So everything's orienting around grace, but just... Um, like the specific admonitions in Scripture and commands of Scripture, the essence of discipleship is teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So you, what you do want to be is a fruit inspector. Like are, like are you seeing fruit that they're observing what Jesus taught, right? So I, 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 think, that there's a, I, I think that there's an implied, in the Scripture, I think that there's, a, there's an implication that we can make a pretty good observation without being judged over somebody's life, but to the degree of effectively guiding them as a disciple and effectively leading the church. That, that, that's, those are the goals. It's not standing as judge over their life, but it's rather being an effective disciple maker. So how do I know how to challenge the disciple -y? You know, well, I'm, I'm inspecting the fruit. I'm speaking to their life. I'm asking them honest questions. I'm asking them to give feedback. Anybody else want to chime in on, on that? Yep, time. Beautiful. This is awesome. So this, um, I would, I'd love to know any thoughts you have on this. These are just our rough draft thoughts. This is very rough draft for us as a church. Brothers, let me pray for you. It's been such an honor to be with you guys. Thank you for your engagement. Massive privilege being in the house today. And when we get this building built... When we move into our building, Lord willing, we'll be regulars at Third Thursday. We'll bring a crew up from Clarksville, down from Clarksville. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name and by your Holy Spirit, we give you glory today. Lord, we just feel like John the Baptist. We are unworthy to unbuckle your sandals, Lord Jesus. But what a privilege that you've made us a little lower than the angels. You've crowned us with glory and honor. Lord, we want to be faithful disciple makers and leaders of your church. So would you equip us by your spirit to that end? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.